Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Caston Centre's event this evening um, entitled ASIO's Catch-22 Asylum in Limbo. Uh, my name is Adam Macbeth. I'm the Acting Director of the Caston Centre for Human Rights Law. And we're joined uh, tonight by three um, extremely notable speakers um, covering a, a broad, um, I guess, series of angles um, on, on this topic, and I'll, I'll introduce you in a moment. But before I do that, I, I wanted first to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet tonight, the, Karun, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, I also uh, need to uh, announce the, uh, the uh, Twitter particulars. Um, if you happen to be a, a tweet, um, <coughs> unlike me, uh, the hashtag and the, um, the details for uh, how to log on as a guest um, at the venue tonight are on this uh, yellow notes uh, on the wall here, if you can't see one, it's, uh, the hashtag is um, CCASIO, and uh, the Casting Centre will be tweeting um, the event uh, so you can, you can follow along. I make no representations about whether or not those will be monitored by ASIO um, or whether or not a file will be kept, so let's do it at your own risk. Um, the, our first speaker tonight um, is the President of Liberty Victoria, uh, Jane Dixon SC. Um, Jane is one of Australia's leading, um, oh, sorry, uh, Liberty of course is one of Australia's Liberty, uh, leading civil liberty uh, organisations. Um, Jane is, um, as, uh, the, uh, the letters SC are a dead, dead giveaway, um, is a leading uh, barrister in, uh, in Australia um, and has practised the Victoria Bar for over 20 years. Uh, Jane is the chair of the Pro Bono Committee of the Victorian Bar and a long-standing member of the Indigenous Lawyers Committee of the Victorian Bar. Um, and uh, I'll uh, introduce uh, Jane, or hand over to Jane, uh, to uh, be our first speaker this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and it's a great honour to be here tonight, particularly with um, such experts as um, Patrick Emerton and Matthew Albert, who will be known to you in the refugee field and very fitting in Refugee Week. Um, and uh, obviously, the politics of um, asylum seekers and refugees um, are uh, an important issue for Liberty Victoria and look like continuing to be so for some time into the future. Um, Jeremy Harding wrote a book um, called Border Vigils, Keeping Migrants Out of the Rich World. Um, and this is a book which is going to be, uh, he's coming out here actually for the Melbourne Writers Festival and uh, he'll be talking about his book and some of his ideas. Um, <clears throat> but um, it's a book well worth reading. And he says in that book, um, which really talks about the, history, the recent history of immigration from the British perspective, um, he, he talks about the increasingly toxic debate around immigration. He says, for example, that 9-11 dealt a blow to freedom of movement for migrants and refugees. And he says that like a front-end collision in a car, it triggered a dramatic security response. Immigration policy was still on the road, but the airbags had gone off. The reflex answer was to apply the brakes, even at the risk of veering away from managed immigration to anti-immigration. And he goes on to say, unease was not just to do with fresh migrant intakes. Politicians in the popular press were deeply concerned about the people already inside their countries, and host cultures now felt freer to speak critically about their minorities. I think we could agree that the same can be said in Australia as we see this increasingly toxic debate which accompanies issues surrounding boat people and this rhetoric of send back the boats, and uh, it's very unfortunate. I'm sure you'll agree. The sense that we get from the politics of the day are aimed at provoking fear of alien cultures and promoting a concern that these people come from troubled lands and they will somehow infect us with their troubles. But the history of immigration to this country over decades simply does not support this focused fear. Now, the position of ASIO detainees is even more dire than that of other asylum seekers and or refugees seeking resettlement in Australia. And uh, uh, you'll know a little bit about this, and I'm not going to be dealing with the legal technicalities in great detail. Um, but for those 50-odd people who have been classified by ASIO as being an adverse security risk, they're in a very different position from other Australians 
facing prosecution, for example, for a, a criminal offence um, that, that um, would be entitled to some kind of procedural rights. Apparently, if you're in the position of these detainees, you have no, um, no apparent procedural rights. So in this country, you can be charged with murder, armed robbery, drug trafficking, drug cultivation, any of those sorts of offences, and you can duly apply for bail, and you may um, get bail. You can be assured of a trial date, whether you get bail or not. Uh, you can be assured that if the, the length to the trial date is too long, you're more likely to get bail. You can apply for legal aid. You can have some confidence in the length of time that you will remain in custody before trial. And uh, if you are ultimately found guilty on the criminal standard of proof, then there are appeal rights that are entrenched within the law. Uh, and uh, upon conviction, you can at least expect to be sentenced within a reasonable period of time after conviction and have some degree of certainty about outcome. These processes are by and large quite transparent and quite accessible to the public, to newspapers, to lawyers, and to family members who would support the prisoner through their sentence and until their, relief, re until their release from imprisonment. This is very far removed, of course, from the circumstances of people like Rangini, and some of you will know of Rangini and the release Rangini campaign, so far unsuccessful, but don't give up. Um, and people like Manakala, Jenna Harson, I'm not sure that I'm pronouncing her name correctly, but both of these two women are obviously um, among the detainees, or, or uh, one of them was. Um, they both were detainees under the current regime, both of Sri Lankan Tamil origin, both mothers with kids detained following an adverse security assessment. We can't know, and they couldn't know, the precise basis for the adverse security assessment, uh, determining them to be um, a risk. And so uh, that assessment couldn't be challenged um, because there's no charge, there's no evidence put forward, there's no um, available process for testing it, no, no natural justice and no hope. <coughs> the implementation of the independent review process um, through Margaret Stone by the current government was it could be said a step in the right direction to giving some kind of procedural, procedural relief to the ASIO detainees. However, even that process has some obvious flaws in that it devolves upon a single person and is also a largely non-transparent uh, process, not subject to um, review or appeal. And of course, it's also subject to the risk um, which uh, more than a risk, I think it's been said that this will occur, that um, if uh, an Abbott government comes in power, that, uh, that independent review will be removed. So, if we regard the independent review process as a type of appeal, although lacking many of the hallmarks of an appellate review, it nevertheless did offer a smidgen of hope to the 50 or so detainees left in limbo under the current procedures. Um, so far, I think very few have been successful. I think only one family um, has been successful in persuading Margaret Stone that the ASIO assessment was wrong. And of course, when you think about it, um, she uh, is provided information by ASIO, and we don't know the extent to which she has any capacity to look behind that information that she's given. Um, so it seems that the outcome of her in relation to one family very recently um, deciding that, that the ASIO assessment was um, not made out was that ASIO, although not obliged to, did release that family. So the fact is even, even uh, if she does decide that uh, ASIO have got it wrong, they're not obliged at that stage to uh, release the, the people concerned, um, and, uh, uh, but in this case they did. The difference between, of course, the current position of Mangini and Manakala is that although they were offered the opportunity of the uh, independent stone review, uh, Manakala was lucky she had her position revoked, um, but, and she and her son Rajivan were able to be released from detention at last. Uh, Mangini was very recently, I think as recently as last week, uh, told that her review was not so, was not successful. So um, in, that, in her case, the independent review um, did take place, but it upheld the ASIO adverse rating. And we, we don't know why, 
Um, obviously, there's some suggestion of association with the Tamil Tigers, perhaps through um, her ex-husband, I think. Um, so it may be the kind of guilt by association that ordinarily the criminal law rails against and doesn't permit. We just don't know, and uh, we're asked to place our faith in ASIO, Margaret Stone, and the quality of information that they had available. Questions to be asked are, even if there were a suspicion that Ranjini had herself participated in some sort of um, activity in Sri Lanka as part of a persecuted minority that um, was um, as a sympathiser for the Tamil Tigers, uh, now that she's in Australia and away from the persecutors, why can't those concerns be managed without her immediate detention? Why not bail for Ranjini or something, something similar, some sort of managed control order? And why is it possible that people charged with criminal offences in this country are often considered quite capable of being managed and monitored under strict bail conditions, sometimes with daily reporting and so on, but people like Ranjini must remain locked up indefinitely? Liberty Victoria, <coughs> Victoria understands that ASIO would have the capacity to monitor those they regard as a security risk, even though they might be at large in the community, but it would require a decision of those with ministerial responsibility favouring a process of some sort of conditional release. Yes. And unfortunately, the current political climate has not been conducive to any informed debate about those matters, and the issue of the processes bringing, out, bringing about the detention are really a bit too complex for short media sound bites. So the black hole continues unabated. The challenge for us as Australians is to let our politicians and local members know that the current process is fundamentally flawed. It's undemocratic and it's unfair. Legislative change to enshrine, enshrine fair and just procedures is essential. Even in matters of public interest immunity in the courts and, and uh, relative secrecy, courts and tribunals have been capable of modifying legal processes so that judicial or administrative oversight and a degree of controlled transparency can occur. And this must surely be preferable to the current approach of turning our back on these unfortunate people and arbitrarily imprisoning them without trial. Professor Ben Saul has suggested a process similar to that used in other jurisdictions, which permits the creation of a role of a special advocate to appear at a tribunal, tribunal such as, for example, the Federal AAT and provide advocacy on merits assessment of applicants' security risk assessments with the capacity perhaps to be monitored in the community under a control order. Britain, parts of Europe, Canada and New Zealand um, already provide a better opportunity for those uh, suspected of being a security, security risk to challenge um, sensitive security information. An improved procedure with the provision of a special advocate would also involve some periodic review by a truly independent decision maker and a degree of minimum disclosure of allegations to persons affected. And uh, minimum disclosure of reasons for the outcome. And this avoids the current difficulty where ASIO effectively acts as both accuser, judge and jury really. And uh, the independent reviewer is captive to the same material, material supplied to and by ASIO in such limited other places as she's been able to institute. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I'm not for one moment suggesting this is the only solution to these problems, but it is a solution, and we need to be thinking through solutions to these problems. Lawyers who work in the field of refugee advocacy experience the effect on cohorts of individuals who share the same black hole of uncertainty. Like Nelson Mandela for much of the term of his imprisonment, these people have no idea when or if they will ever be released and those that can survive this cruel regime of uncertainty live with the experience of witnessing daily self-harm by others and, in some cases, suicides. As a criminal lawyer of over 20 years' experience, I'm very used to um, my clients um, simply wanting to know um, what, what are their chances of being acquitted, uh, and then if they're unsuccessful at the end of a trial, um, when will they be sentenced? And then how long, and as soon as they are sentenced, basically the mathematical calculation, exactly what is their release date. And even the most hardened criminals, when given information about an actual release date, can usually psychologically seem to accept their fate and, and uh, manage to move on with their life. But for these unfortunate people, there is simply no certainty um, and uh, no hope whatsoever.
and uh, uh, this is something that we should not stand for as a uh, as a nation. Um, so I'll hand over now to uh, I think uh, Matthew Albert. Patrick, sorry, Patrick Edmonton. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jen. We're keeping it short and sharp from our speakers tonight, so as to give you the opportunity to uh, uh, engage in questions with our, with our panel at the end. Um, so, uh, very quickly, let me introduce uh, Dr. Patrick Edmonton, who's my colleague at the uh, Myash Law Faculty and Associate of the Cassin Centre for Human Rights Law. Uh, Patrick is our resident expert on um, counter-terrorism laws and has made numerous submissions uh, to Parliament uh, and given evidence of parliamentary inquiries uh, on that topic. Uh, and when he's not busy on counter-terrorism laws, his, uh, his uh, area of expertise and uh, concentration is legal philosophy. So uh, join me in welcoming Patrick Edmonton. Thanks, Adam. Well, yeah, my main area of work really is in the legal and political theory. And there's a lot in what Jane was saying about sort of broad exceptions of um, freedom and democracy. And I think when we're talking about sort of contemporary people movements, also issues around international politics and the consequences of imperialism and so on, issues also around race and racism. So there's kind of many sort of um, political uh, dimensions and sort of justice dimensions to this issue of refugees in Australia. And also I think there's issues around um, the traditions of our legal system and its attitude towards liberty and, um, and ideas about the permissibility and the impermissibility of imprisonment, and particularly executive imprisonment. So I think um, there's a lot of issues in play, but perhaps slightly tediously, I'm going to focus on some legal issues, particularly uh, some issues around ASIO and the idea of security with which ASIO works. So, I mean, ASIO's original job, I mean, roughly but not inaccurately, was to fight communists, particularly by spying on them. And that job obviously has mostly passed, although one gathers they still spy from time to time on those remnant communists or their substitutes who are left. But particularly over the past 10 or so years, ASIO's role seems to have become more and more mainstream or ubiquitous in the administration of much larger parts of our legal and justice system. So, for example, although ASIO is not a police force, um, it's an intelligence gathering agency, or as I like them, a spy agency. I think spy is a short and pithy word to capture what ASIO does. They get involved very heavily in um, criminal investigations and prosecutions in the sort of terrorism area. And they turn out now to play a very significant role in issues around admission or non admission of a wide range of people seeking admission into Australia. I think it's quite significant that ASIO is a spy agency. It's not a criminal investigation agency, so it's not a police force. And I think thinking about that helps to understand and to elaborate some of the points James made. That ASIO is not subject either in its practices day to day or in its institutional culture to the discipline of judicial and adjudicative oversight that plays a significant role, however limited and sometimes inadequate a role, nevertheless plays a significant role in disciplining and controlling the police power. The criminal investigation ultimately is subject to the discipline of bringing prosecutions, having bail claims made on behalf of accused and so on. A discipline that then helps enforce in a practical way legality in the actions of the police. ASIO isn't subject to that sort of discipline in the way it undertakes its work. It's not subject to court oversight, as has been explained. The oversight in this particular area is by an ad hoc executive process, now it's known as sort of the, the special reviewer. I think the capacity of this lack of discipline on ASIO's part to lead ASIO into illegality isn't merely fanciful. I think it's demonstrated by ASIO's history, particularly its role in the notorious Al Haq case which was a terrorism prosecution in the Supreme Court of New South Wales, which in the end uh, came to an end because the only 
evidence against the accused was his own admission, and that was excluded by Justice Adams of the New South Wales Supreme Court on grounds that it was tainted by criminality, namely criminality by officers of ASIO in collecting that information, in particular criminality in the form of <coughs> kidnap and also the crime of false imprisonment uh, for additional uh, um, irregularity. The tort of false imprisonment also tainted the evidence, but I think the criminal tainting was more than ample to exclude that evidence. There was then an internal investigation which um, said that the judge had got it wrong and the ASIO officers had it in fact understood that by telling this man there was an easy way or a hard way and so they should come with him and then after they talked to him go and tell the police the same thing that they didn't understand that he might think he had no choice and was being coerced. But I don't, my own view is that ASIO aren't particularly naive and are quite good spies and I think they do understand what coercion and manipulation and intimidation involved and require and that's indeed their stopping trade because that's the stocking trade as far. So I think the Al-Hat case shows that ASIO not being subject to those sorts of disciplines don't have a culture of legality in respect to the rule of law in the same way that some other institutions do. And I think it's quite an important cultural achievement. I mean, a great admirer for anyone who knows E.B. Thompson, the Marxist historian who was kicked out of the British Communist Party for writing his book, Wigs and Hunters at the conclusion to which he described the rule of law as it was developed in British justice as a great cultural achievement of universal importance. And I have quite a degree of sympathy for E.P. Thompson's view on that, that achieving legality in a practical sense is an important cultural achievement. And I think seeing it trashed in various ways as it's currently happening in aspects of Australia's administration of various areas of law and justice is a cultural loss, which particularly those of us who are involved in the legal profession uh, in a strong place to push back against. But you don't need illegality on ASIO's part to get bad decisions in the area of migration security assessments, even when ASIO is acting in accordance with its statutory obligations and permissions. My view is that the results have a good chance of being bad, and that is because of the way the statute is framed. And this goes back to my earlier point that ASIO raison d'etre is for being spies. So, I'm now going to say a couple of things about the Migration Act that I hope they're not horribly wrong because there's certainly a speaker who knows that act very well and there's probably members of the audience who know that act better than I do. But, at least this is my understanding. So, from 2005 up until late last year, ASIO got dealt in to the protection visa business, in part through public interest criteria in 4002 under the Migration Regulations, which stated that you couldn't be issued with a protection visa unless you were not assessed by ASIO as a risk to security within the meaning of Section 4 of the ASIO Act. In the High Court decision, the M47 decision, towards the end of last year, the validity of that regulation, well, sorry, I say, that regulation was struck down as ultra virus the statute. But as best I understand how our very complex migration regime works, ASIO still play a role in making security assessments at two points in the current process. One would be in advising the Minister on whether or not to lift the bar under Section 46A2 is to allow a visa application to be made by an offshore entry person because by default the statute prohibits them from making an application unless the Minister lifts the bar. And also Section 501 of the Act allows the Minister to refuse visas on character grounds and I would think that ASIO security assessments would also be used to feed into the Minister's character assessment. So even though the regulations that deal with ASIO would have been struck down, other parts of the regime that continue still deal ASIO in as giving advice to the Minister on exercising certain powers or functions under the Act. When ASIO gives that advice, when it issues security assessments, it acts under Section 17.1c and Section 37.1 of its own Act, the ASIO Act. And these define a security assessment as a statement in writing which provides recommendations, opinions or advice on the question of whether it will be consistent with the requirements of security 
for the administrative action in question to be taken. And security in the ASIO Act is a defined term. Security is a notion to be understood at large. And security does not mean Australia's security. <coughs> now, I have some extremely primitive projection here. <coughs> One or two people here have suffered through my classes, so they're familiar with my very primitive projection. But I will at least try to zoom it in. So it might be illegible. I'm talking about 140. Might be okay. So security, as I say, is not an large notion. The notion of security is defined in Section 4 of the ASIO Act, and it has a quite a compendious definition. So it talks about stuff that's not surprising, like espionage and sabotage. <coughs> it includes the notion of promotion of communal violence, attacks on Australia's defence system, acts of foreign interference. It also includes the notion of politically motivated violence, and I want to come back to that. That notion um, is itself very expansive. It's further defined in the act. It's a very expansive notion. We have the idea of protecting Australia's territorial, territorial and border integrity from serious threats. And we also have the notion of, and this is very important, of carrying out Australia's responsibilities to any foreign country in relation to a matter mentioned earlier. So security as it's defined in the ASIO Act, and therefore the notion of security as it informs the making of security assessments, is not confined to issues pertaining to Australia, but also brings in foreign policy notions. Australia's responsibility to any foreign country in relation to such matters as politically motivated violence. Now, some of this we can pass over. Attacks on Australia's defence system has the sort of definition you would expect, and that's not very exciting. Promotion of communal violence likewise has the sort of definition you would expect, and that's not very surprising. But politically motivated violence is defined, and the definition of this is interesting and important. Acts or threats of violence or unlawful harm intended or likely to achieve a political objective, whether in Australia or elsewhere, including acts or threats carried on for the purpose of influencing the policy or acts of the government, whether in Australia or elsewhere, also includes acts that are terrorism offences. That's then defined in turn by reference to Part 5.3 of the Criminal Code, which creates um, over a dozen offences that are terrorism offences. But a striking feature of all those offences is that they are likewise not confined to Australia. Terrorism offences can involve act organisations, actors, governments and politics anywhere in the world. And also, a significant number of terrorism offences probably about half of them, do not have as a requirement any intention or hope on the part of the accused person that any violence take place. So you can commit a terrorism offence even if no, at no point do you have either a violent actus or violent mens rea. So we have this very expansive notion of political violence, including terrorism offence, which deals in stuff which happens well outside Australia and doesn't include violence. So for the definition of political politically motivated violence under the ADO Act includes acts which don't have violence as an element. And we've also got this notion of obligations to foreign countries being part of security. And it's not an accident that ASEO is looking at these things in the immigration context. In 2005, amendments were made for migration regulations, which were expressly intended, as set out in the statement that accompanied those amendments to make sure that ASIO, in considering security and migration matters, had regard to Australia's foreign policy obligations to foreign countries. And so we get a situation in which security and security assessments for asylum seekers is framed not by reference to the popular notion of Australian security and protecting Australia, but by reference to this technical compendious definition which brings in foreign policy obligations and foreign policy goals into the core of it. I submit that foreign policy goals are very important for spies. <coughs> Spying is a foreign policy operation. But I don't understand what foreign policy goals remotely have to do with whether or not Australia is in a position to honour its protection obligations to people who are seeking asylum in this country. And so I think getting this definition of security changed 
insofar as it pertains to the question of whether or not people are entitled to be admitted to this country is a matter of the highest priority. Thanks, Patrick. And so now we have the political context, we have the legal framework, at least, at least insofar as the definition is concerned. Uh, and now uh, we're about to hear um, from the lawyer of uh, the Janet, uh, Janet Harson um, uh, pair, who were uh, referred to uh, by Jane as having been released from, uh, from detention just, uh, just recently following um, the overturning of, of their ASIO assessments. Um, and that lawyer is Matthew Welb, a, a, a Melbourne barrister um, who's represented a number of um, refugees, including, uh, including um, the Janet Harson uh, pair, as well as um, a, 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 a group of refugees um, or an individual, I'm not sure, um, who's currently um, in, in, involved in this, in this process. Um, and uh, prior to uh, joining the uh, Victorian Bar, um, Matthew's worked with uh, Geoffrey Robertson, QC, in London. Um, he's worked for the Victorian Government, Government Solicitor's Office, the Solicitor General, and um, for, uh, as an Associate to Justice Habsburg for the Supreme Court. So he knows the ins and outs of the legal system. Um, join me in welcoming um, Matthew Well. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, introduction, and um, can I say that I'm very glad to see so many people here um, for Refugee Week, but can I say that I'm particularly thrilled looking out to see um, so many ASIO officers among you. Um, I'm thrilled that you're here, um, and as the saying goes, I think you know who you are. Um, what I wanted to do was to kind of give the real world of how this is working, but also in perhaps uh, an attempt to give everybody a little bit of hope to paint a picture of what's happening in the courts that is trying to um, change the way the scheme is operating. So let's start with how it's presently working. In practice, the real world uh, is this. A person comes to Australia, they make a protection claim. Their protection claim is assessed usually over a very long period and at the moment maybe not being assessed at all. At the end of that assessment, the person will be uh, determined to be a person to whom we owe protection obligations, either because they fill the refugee criteria or, as of March last year, because they are entitled to protection on the basis of what's called complementary protection. Now, in the event that they are found to be owed protection obligations, ordinarily uh, something will happen that will mean that they are released from detention. I've got two clients who have been subject to ASIO assessments and they actually have uh, demonstrated the two different ways. Um, one, being Manakawa, was given a uh, residence determination. So the minister decided that for the remainder of her process, she and her son Raghavan could live in the community and so they did for a number of months. The second of my clients was given a visa albeit a short-term visa, but he was given a visa and released on to, into the community on that basis. So here they are living among us. Now in those two cases, and as far as I'm aware, every other case of the 50 uh, people who are detained, precisely nothing has happened during their time um, in the community. Nothing at all. Then, after a period of months, they get a subsequent letter from the Department of Immigration saying, Sorry about releasing you into the community, we have to take you back into detention, and the reason for that is ASIO have told us that you might be a national security risk. And so, having been released into the community, having been among us, they're taken back into detention for, for most of them, an indefinite period of time while their ASIO assessment uh, is conducted. Now, that ASIO assessment, which, as you hopefully now understand, is something completely separate from their refugee assessment, um, is done at the pace that the uh, Department of Immigration so chooses. And it's that pace that is the subject of discussion, uh, or rather subject of litigation, uh, 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 in the very near future and has indeed partially been the subject of litigation already. The litigation history, the legal context in which all of this happens, really starts with a non-ASIO case, and that is a case probably familiar to most, if not all of you, uh, of Al-Khateb. In Al-Khateb, the High Court, by the slimmest of majorities, 
said that it was uh, lawfully possible in this country for a person to be subject to administrative detention indefinitely. That was Mr. Alcatev, not about ASIO assessments. The context in which we are now uh, uh, gives rise to the same fundamental legal questions about the capacity to detain someone indefinitely. And it is Alcatev and 4 3 decision that is uh, sought to be challenged uh, for the second time in as many years in a proceeding that's just recently uh, gone on foot. From Alcatev, we jump uh, forward to last year and the first of those two proceedings, M47, which has already uh, been mentioned. In M47, they challenged directly the ASIO assessment and as part of the challenge, challenged the regulation which gave the power for that assessment to have any uh, meaning. The regulation, as has rightly been said already, was found to be invalid. Make no mistake, that was a very narrow basis on which the case was decided. Some members of the bench uh, enthusiastically uh, sought it uh, or took it as an opportunity to reanalyse um, Al Kateb. Um, perhaps most notably, um, Justice Gummo uh, enthusiastically agreed with himself um, <laughs> from uh, Al Kateb and restated his position, and in the process had a um, what can only be described as a judicial swipe at um, Justice McHugh, saying, what Justice McHugh understood at, that time, at the time has changed, we're now much wiser and more knowledgeable, and so what I said before was even more right than when I said it last time. Um, Justice Gummo, uh, as I said, uh, embraced it enthusiastically. Justice Crennan, perhaps uh, most vocally, but Justice Hayne also, uh, said, we don't need to decide this issue, we don't need to look at Alcatel in this case because we have this much narrower basis. And so it was that the regulation was rendered invalid, and we find ourselves in the position we're in. The regulation being rendered invalid had the effect that instead of the decision being in the hands, as it were, of ASIO, the decision went into the hands entirely of the Minister for Immigration. The Minister for Immigration uh, has, under the Act, an obligation to make decisions about uh, protection claims and visa uh, applications. Now, that uh, obligation is one that was sought to be challenged in M47, was left hanging, and was the subject of a subsequent challenge, which ended, I think, last week or the week before. The subsequent challenge was a case called S138, and it sought to go to the fundamentals, and again to raise al Kateb in this context. The Minister, in his uh, wisdom, uh, pursued or let the applicant plaintiff pursue the case um, up until uh, a matter of days before the matter was to be heard by the High Court, at which point uh, those, the people who are behind the name S138 were uh, reassessed and magically all of a sudden they were no longer a security assessment and they were released into the community. They were the group uh, released and there was a bit of press about it uh, recently um, after Manakala. But there's another proceeding. The other proceeding is the one to keep an eye out for and the other proceeding is the one that in theory will be round to Avalpatev with a new uh, High Court bench of course with Justice Gummo um, no longer there. The new case it has to be said because of all these shortenings it's a fantastically um, uh, difficult area to keep tabs on. M47, the person previously known as M47, very inconveniently, is now known as M46. <laughs> so M46, who happens to be exactly the same person as M47, um, is, uh, has recently, a couple of weeks ago, launched a new proceeding. That new proceeding seeks two forms of relief. Number one, mandamus. The minister is obliged under the act, as I said, to make a decision and the mandamus, the written mandamus, would have it that the minister actually make a decision. In this case, perhaps, to reject the visa application so that the lawyers acting for him have something to challenge. The second writ that is being sought is the writ of habeas corpus. And the writ of habeas corpus, as no doubt everybody would know, 
uh, the ancient Greeks being one to say, why are you detaining this person? Explain to us why you're detaining them. Those are the forms of relief uh, being sought, uh, and that case is, as I say, um, the next one to watch. The introduction of the procedure um, being led by Margaret Stone uh, should be seen, uh, in my view, very clearly in the context of Alcatel. Because, from a legal point of view, the Margaret Stone initiative is uh, one by which the minister will presumably run the argument that they are not indefinitely detained. The allegation will no doubt be made by the plaintiffs in um, uh, M46, if not subsequent cases, that their clients are detained indefinitely and that that's uh, unconstitutional because it's the executive exercising judicial power. The minister, I would assume, will respond to that by saying, ah, 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 not forever, just until next year when the reviewer will come back and have another fresh look to see whether they're still a risk to security. One wonders how information is going to change from one year to another when, for the entire period of that year, a person is going to be detained. But that, uh, supposedly, is the way uh, that it's supposed to work and is presumably the method by which the Minister will seek to wriggle out of the suggestion that the people being detained indefinitely. Manakala um, uh, was released a few weeks ago. Um, I'm limited, in a sense, by what I can say, but um, what I think is very important to note, um, because it was uh, plain misinformation, um, was that there was nothing new that came to light uh, before she was released. She arrived in Australia on, uh, in March 2010. She was found to be a refugee in February 2011, 11 months later. She was then released into the community until October, during which, as I said, precisely nothing happened. And she was in detention then from uh, uh, the 24th of October 2011 until the 23rd of May 2013. We put in submissions. The process had begun through Margaret Stone and we got what are public documents which are a couple of page summary from ASIO uh, in which supposedly the allegations are uh, put to you in a way that you can in some way respond. They are general, uh, unspecified, uh, no sources, no real details um, in them and you're supposed to in some way respond to them um, meaningfully perhaps most notably, respond to a source that you don't know. That paper was released. We were on the verge of putting in uh, submissions. The submissions were going to be strong. Uh, but the submissions didn't eventually go in because beforehand, and only a few days after <coughs> the age had done a very notable feature on Ragavan, uh, the Attorney General was able all of a sudden to release them. <coughs> The Attorney General, and this is the information that um, I think it is important to clear up, the Attorney General said, that, look, here's proof of the new system. The new reviews work fantastically. We can prove it because we've just released someone. The thing is, there'd been no review. There was no new system operating to benefit her. All that happened, uh, one can only assume, I don't know this, one can only assume that a new set of eyes looked at the old information and saw what we saw, which was absolutely no basis for her being detained uh, at all. From a legal practitioner's point of view, um, in case it's not uh, self-evident, the um, system as it operates is uh, unsatisfactory on many, many levels. We operate in a vacuum, a legal vacuum, a process vacuum, and a detail vacuum. And for a profession that is built on all three of those things, that makes representing people very hard, if not uh, impossible. The process is also very drawn out, and by virtue of the circumstances of those people affected by these assessments, it requires that people act uh, pro bono, which um, all of those of us who do it are very happy to do 
but there's no mistaking that exhaustion sets in in firms and individuals uh, in that process because of the uh, duration of it. Um, the bigger point, though, is, uh, in my mind, not really about the individuals who are affected. The bigger point is what this says about us as a society and us as a country. I suspect I'm preaching to the converted, but it's a point uh, well worth making. That what this symbolises is not necessarily mistreatment of 50 people, but more what it is that we as a country are willing to tolerate and our legal system is willing to allow. And it's for that reason that the challenges are important, it's for that reason that pursuing the fundamental issues um, is so crucial, and the most fundamental of all of them, and it's been mentioned, of course, is the rule of law. Um, can I end by um, adopting words from an American case? Um, the American case, the circumstances of the American case are actually um, similar in a number of respects to the situation that we're discussing this evening. The case was a case uh, in 2002, uh, and it was, therefore, in the recent aftermath of September 11. The judge was a judge called Damon Keith, and he wrote on behalf of the three-judge panel giving a unanimous uh, uh, decision. The decision, I think, um, very vividly explains why it is on a fundamental level that we should be uh, worried, and as I say, I adopt his words entirely. He says this, democracies die behind closed doors. When government begins closing doors, it selectively controls information rightfully belonging to the people. Selective information he says, is misinformation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Uh, we have um, a, a period of time now for uh, questions from the audience. Um, Dennis here will be um, walking around with the, with the roving microphone, so if you'd like to ask a question, please throw it in and we'll get a microphone to you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask Matthew Albert, uh, why have mandamus and the other scopes not been used before? Why haven't they been deployed before? They seem to go precisely to the major objections about the procedure, which is that the uh, minister won't take the decisions that he's supposed to be taking, uh, and that nobody will produce the body. Um, I think, oh, that is worth Very good. Um, I, I agree with you. Um, I, I think I'm right, and if, if I'm wrong, someone can correct me, but I'm, I'm almost certain that in M47, that is M46 Mark 1, those writs were sought, and that's what I mean by the very narrow approach taken by the High Court. They took the shortest route home, which of course they can, but um, they took the shortest route home and didn't deal with those more fundamental issues, and I, from memory, Habeas Corpus was sought in M47, but they didn't have to go to it. Uh, I mean, habeas corpus was definitely sought in M47, and Justices Gallo and Bell would have granted it um, on conditions. So that would have sort of been on conditions analogous to bail conditions. They could spell out what the conditions would be. Um, and Justice Gallo made it fairly clear that, in his view, um, there, there's a very important issue of statutory construction because this, the detention provisions in the statute are framed as such that you can detain until certain events occur not unless certain events occur. And he took it that, that word until introduces sort of temporal presupposition, which if it fails because nothing's happening, then the proper construction, if there's no power of attention, because a narrow construction under the general principles of interpretation, therefore habeas corpus should issue. So I actually thought that the majority of the decision in 47 was quite disgraceful, perhaps too strong, but they really squibbed on confronting the real issue, which is the availability of habeas corpus. And I think in a sense, and I'm I hinted at this, but there's a, there's a bit of judicial politics, I suspect, behind it, in that uh, a, a new bench was uh, about to be formed, which we now have, whereas uh, at the time of M47, um, Justices Hayden and uh, Gummo were still there and they'd kind 
what have given their view in Alcatel. Uh, so that's perhaps the reason why M46 presents an even better opportunity than M47, just by virtue of the passing of time. Any other questions? Um, I've just got a question for um, any of you, I guess. Uh, with the recent S138 decision, there was a few different grounds run to really challenge Alcatel in terms of uh, the constitutional argument or the principle of legality argument or a procedural fairness argument. Just in your opinion, which one do you think is the one that's kind of more likely to succeed in overturning that decision? Um, so in the, with the Act as it's currently drafted, I think the principle of legality argument is strong because I think the, the, the point that the word until isn't synonymous with the word unless, it, it admits of a more narrow reading with the temporal presupposition and when we're construing a power of tension, we should construe it narrowly. So I think, I mean, that argument is the strongest with the Act as it's currently worded. I think if the Act were to be amended so the power of detention reported to be uh, detained unless, then, then I think the, the constitutional issue would have to be confronted um, squarely. And I mean, I have a view on that, but I think the better view is that that will be unconstitutional under Chapter 3, but I'm not sure that's a view the High Court would share. Um, I'd agree with that, but I, I think the answer um, as to what result we'll get in terms of jurisprudence is um, going to be almost entirely determined by judicial appetite um, as to what the court's uh, up to in terms of the depth of the uh, analysis that they're going to go to. Last time, I think, um, I'd speak for a number of people in saying that there was general disappointment that it was, um, to use Patrick's word, squibbed. Um, uh, as it was, but um, in terms of clarifying the area, those big questions still remain. Any questions? Well, uh, while, uh, while people uh, think up a question, I'm going to ask a question of my own. Then. Um, in in M47, the the High Court, um, in, in fact, I think from every um, virtually every judge, if, if not every judge, in, in uh, M47, um, found that there was no breach of procedural fairness, so they, they were quite satisfied that the level of detail that was disclosed to the detainee uh, was, uh, was adequate, that, there was, that the allegations had been put to them, that they had the opportunity to respond, um, that there was enough information there. That's contrary to what we hear in the media surrounding this case. Um, those of us not privy to it can only either read the judgment or read the, the media um, reporting on it. Um, do you have anything to, to add to that? Is it, is, is it surprising that they were so easily satisfied that, with the, the procedural fairness in that case? Um, I wasn't involved in M47, so my information is, is limited, but what I do know about M47 that wasn't in the judgment was that he was given unusual uh, levels of uh, access to information, and the interviews were very long, and I think there are a number of them. So in the underlying facts of M47 were quite significantly different from both of my clients um, and the process that they've gone through. And I think that's the only light in which you can read M47 on that question. Um, in Alcatel, there was mixed reception of international human rights law and how that can affect interpretation. Is that something you'll be seeking to, to bring to the fore again? Or will you be pinning arguments on the number two or domestic constitution only? And where do you see the integration of international human rights in the current High Court in the future? Um, that's a great question. Um, I'm not involved in M46, but I am involved in that one of my clients is likely to be attached to M46. Um, uh, my own view is that I think we're in um, a period with this High Court of um, not being very engaged in international law analysis on domestic questions. Um, I think the 
I mean, big question marks hang again by virtue of time over the approaches of Justices um, Keane and Gaber. Um, and it's very hard to say what way they might look at international law aspects, but as a the general tenor of the High Court um, in migration matters over the last few years, in my view, has been towards a strict domestic uh, approach to these sort of questions, and I would anticipate they continue in that trend, um, just by virtue of form over the recent past. Um, in, so as someone who uh, isn't a migration lawyer but does work in constitutional law and theory, so I mean, reading these immigration cases, I mean, there's no doubt that the international law aspects of the Refugee Convention are taken very seriously because they go to the question of statutory construction. And I think um, it at least would make sense that other aspects of international human rights law would go then to the question of statutory construction. But I think in terms of getting a robust answer on the constitutional question, it's the constitutional question should end up getting forced, yeah. perhaps by, by a redrafting of the Act, to change the wording from until to unless. And then I think both, that, that I agree that the current approach of the court will probably be to decide that on a domestic constitutional basis, but in my own preference will be for it to be decided in that way. I think. Um, given sort of the history and the tenor of our constitutional jurisprudence, a decision on something of that significance decided on international human rights law grounds would be contentious and arguably unconstitutional, whereas a decision on very firm and well-reasoned chapter three grounds would develop the kind of ongoing momentum of the cable jurisprudence, plus pick up on the kind of the long traditions of the older sort of boilermakers and related jurisprudence, I, mean, I think a very strong Chapter 3 decision there could be significant, not only in this area, but also into other areas. I mean, I think aspects around persona designata and um, interception warrants, for example, are well right for revisitation since Justice McHugh's excellent dissent in the Grollo case. So I think, um, for many reasons, a strong Chapter 3 decision would, in terms of setting up our jurisprudence to go forward, not just in this field, but a lot of other fields, I think would be a desirable thing. At least that's my own view. I was going to comment on that, but I was just going to ask you this question, Patrick, because you have so much and so long experience in this field. Um, talk in the newspapers today is political comment commentators saying, well, we, we shouldn't have to be bound by the Refugee Convention. You know, we should move away from any obligation under the Refugee Convention. And um, it's the problem. Um, and if we didn't have to worry about it, we wouldn't have this problem. Um, to what extent should we be fearing um, political decisions more than anything else in the, in the near future? I mean, I mean, I'm not sure what the denunciation procedures are for the Refugee Convention. I assume it contains them. I mean, it's been sort of widely commented in this area that this, this sort of the, the official, the public Australian attitude towards refugees is very strange and kind of topsy-turvy because there's a lot of hostility to arrivals who are entitled to protection under the Convention. But in the least at the official level, there's a high degree of sympathy to overseas sort of claimants and people who are brought under the managed program, and of course they're not entitled under the Convention, although arguably there might be other forms of international legal entitlement for those people. So it's kind of long been argued that the Australian politics is framed in terms of a political morality which is kind of topsy-turvy relative to the to the Convention obligations. And I think that's one plausible way of reading the politics, and in that sense, I mean, if it, there was a sort of a democratic push to denounce for Australia to denounce the convention, well, then our role, who want to uphold it, will be to engage in democratic politics and push back. I mean, in that, in that sense, I mean, ultimately, the democracy, at least my view, is that foreign policy should be under the control of the people, not sort of merely the government. I mean, that's part of the democracy, that's part of the objection of ASIO that's so undemocratic in so many ways. So I think if we're, we're concerned that the politics is pushing against the democratic politics, pushing in the wrong direction, the obligation is going to push back. And so that's what I see part of the, the national ASIO campaign is doing, which is a campaign being to be headed by the New South Wales um, civil liberty groups, but Victoria is involved and the Catholic Centre is involved, and that's trying to push back in the sphere of democratic politics that these values are important and 
not only sort of the elite lawyers should care about them or have an interest, but they sort of matter more broadly. So I think it, when there's political questions, I think politics is the way to push back. Any two more questions? Um, I was just curious to know your views on why it is that um, uh, the, I guess, the Australian Community Board it doesn't seem particularly concerned with these big principle, big value ideas, you know, the, what it means to the mainstream when someone comes out and says this is an this is an offence to the rule of law, that sort of thing. Why is it that um, those sorts of messages don't seem to have much political value? I think part of it is that um, the Australian community doesn't really understand some of the um, procedural complexities and don't understand um, the issue, for example, these people in indefinite detention. It's too hard to get the message across somehow to make them understand that it's not a simple matter of sending back the boats and sending them back to where they came from. We're not entitled to do that under the Refugee Convention and this is a point that they don't seem to get. And so um, it is as if um, the media has, has saturated people with um, a message about refugees and they just switch off. and. Uh, uh, Getting some kind of re-engagement is a difficult process and I think it can only be done by explaining the stories that attach to the people. Um, and so just as after the Second World War, um, there was tension in the community about accepting large numbers of refugees. Over time, uh, people began to appreciate the value of those people and what they brought to this country. And we need to foster that value again. And but in, in, uh, it doesn't help when you have cases where people are labelled with numbers like 47 and 46 and so on. Um, but it would be useful if we could somehow get their life stories out into the community and make people understand that they have nothing to fear and uh, that there is a lot of value for uh, Australians in, in being a little more generous. Um, on this, these areas, not particularly around migration, but around national security and anti-terrorism law more generally, I've appeared many times in front of the Senate Legal and Constitutional Committee and also the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Intelligence and Security. And one thing that's very um, notable is the contempt for members from both sides, but particularly, it's particularly noted from a certain sort of Labor member for international human rights law and international norms. And so, and I think this is a long history of a type of um, nationalist patriotism, at least in, in all Australian politicians, but it's particularly noticeable in a certain part of the Labor Party, I think, and also a scepticism about law and lawyers and courts. I mean, there are reasons that we have a long tradition on the Labor side of politics of trying to get industrial relations, for example, out of the courts, and that Kirk's decision sort of didn't come from nowhere. Those processes that the High Court struck out, having Kirk have a long history. So I think there's also work to be done in trying to persuade politicians of the importance of certain values and values of legality, particularly those in parties where you might expect a degree of sympathy, but for historical reasons there's a history of a certain scepticism or hostility. And so again, part of I think working in democratic politics isn't just working with people, but working with their political representatives who to some extent play a leadership role in informing popular opinion and leading popular opinion. And I think, so I think you know, there's a lot of politicians who aren't convinced of the value of legality. They have other views about why they're important values. So if we think these things are important, we need to talk to them and try to persuade them. Does anyone have like any uh, distinction over the last question before we close up tonight? No? Well, no. Uh, I, I, might, I might close up on that, on that note there. Um, I'll, I'll save the uh, note of thanks to the speakers for the end because that it compels you to listen to the other points I wanted to make. Um, the first of them 
<clears throat> the first of them is, uh, I think I've neglected at the beginning uh, tonight to acknowledge that in fact it is a, uh, this is a, not only a Gaston Zero event but a joint event uh, co-hosted by Liberty Victoria, uh, a marvellous organisation. I'm a member and you should all be members too. Um, they do wonderful uh, advocacy work. Um, of course, James, the, uh, the President, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> who spoke to us tonight. So we're very grateful for um, the, the co-hosting of the event um, by, by Liberty Victoria. Um, because you have uh, chosen to uh, attend an event in June, that means that you are subject to our fundraising appeal. Um, because, uh, of course, uh, we have an annual appeal, as many uh, uh, non-profit organisations do. And uh, so there, if you're um, of a mind to support the work that the Caston Centre does, uh, including uh, to hold uh, free events regularly, like the one um, that we're at, uh, here tonight, uh, you can see Janice Hugo who's over there on your way out. She'll have forms to uh, facilitate your donation. We'd be most grateful for that so we can continue to do the work that we do. I'm sure Liberty would be equally grateful for donations of the same sort. Um, go to libertyvictoria.org.au Liberty for them. Um, thank you to all of you for coming along tonight, and finally, thank you. Um, Great thanks to our three speakers. We've had tonight the great privilege of hearing um, both enormous breadth and enormous detail about a very complicated and unusually complicated, but also um, a, a, an extremely important um, issue for who we are um, as a nation, who we are um, as human beings and the way that we treat our fellow human beings. So please join with me in thanking um, from the bottom of all of our hearts and thanks for